I've been thinking about executables a lot lately. More specifically, how are they run? And just like anything, there are explanations that are quite simple and explanations that are complex, along with a spectrum of everything in between. In this video, I kind of want to start from the simplest explanation and move our way up towards the complex, but maybe land somewhere in the middle. So the simple explanation is that executables are run using the exec family of syscalls. And the reason that exec is a family of syscalls is because there is actually several exec syscalls, with each of them taking slightly different parameters. In this example, we're going to look at exec ve, but you could just as well have chosen several of the others. So if we look at the function signature of exec ve, we can see that it takes a path name, argv, which is a null terminated character array that consists of the arguments that we want to pass to the executable, and the nv, which is a null terminated character array that we're going to pass as the environment variables that are accessible to the executable. So if we actually fill these in with some realistic values so we can see kind of how this would take shape. Say we wanted to run the ls, and then we want to pass in the parameters lh, and we don't actually care about passing any environment variables in this case. And in fact, since this syscall actually exists as a mapping in the user space, we can just call this from a C program if we want to build one. So here we've got a main C, we have to include the standard Unix library so that we've got access to this syscall. And then we just pass in those parameters like we did before. Now if we compile this and run the main executable, what we'll see is that it runs ls. So that makes sense. And that's like the simplest way to understand how programs are executed. We use the execution syscall. But let's start digging a little bit deeper into how is that exec syscall actually working under the hood? Well, first we have to ask, what is an executable? And if we run the file command on our executable that we built in the last step, we'll get a little bit of information about that. So this kind of throws a lot of information in our face, but let's try to organize it a little bit. First, we can see that we have an ELF 64-bit LSB shared object. So that tells us what kind of file this is. Then we've got an x86-64. We'll go into more information on that. We can see it's dynamically linked, and the interpreter is found at this path. So what do each of these things mean? Well, the ELF 64-bit shows that it's of the type executable and linkable format, which is just a standard Linux format that is used for executing files. x86-64, this tells us the assembly instruction set that this executable was built for, and this is usually tied to the processor that the executable is meant to be run on. Dynamically linked means that this executable is going to depend on finding other files on the system at runtime. And then the interpreter is the program that this executable will want to use to find those runtime files. So the big thing here that we need to explain is what is an executable? Well, in Linux, an executable is an ELF, which is, like I just said, the executable and linkable format. And what that is, is a format. It's a standard Unix format that specifies the way that these files should be structured so that when they're read in by the exec syscall, we know how to parse it. And every single one of these ELF files starts with something called an ELF header. This is the very first thing that you'll find in the file. And what is the ELF header? Well, it's basically like an introduction to the file along with a table of contents. It gives the exec syscall or whatever happens to be loading this software an instruction set for how to load this software into memory. So here we can see like the kind of information that is stored in the ELF header. And likewise, this is a lot of information to just throw at you if this is your first time seeing it. So I'm just gonna pick out a couple of them that I think are important. And you can always go through the documentation and read more about it afterwards if you want to. But so the first one is the E type. What kind of ELF is this? Uh, in our case, we're gonna be looking at the executable ELF. There are a couple other things, because ELFs are not actually just executables, they're executable and linkable. So in this case, we're going to be talking about the executable version of that. Next is the e-entry. This is the entry point of our, our execution. And so this is when our process has been loaded into memory. Where do we want to jump execution to so that we can actually run our new program? And so, for example, in our main, this is 0x1080. 
Next, we've got the EPH off, which is the program header table offset. This tells us how far into this file we can find the program header table, which we're going to go into in a little bit more detail soon. And you can see that that's actually viewable in our structure of this main file. So 64 bytes into the file, we would find the program header table. Next is epnt size. This just tells us how long in bytes is a program header entry. And then epHNum is how many entries are there. For now, those are the only ones that we're going to cover. And from all of that information, we're able to kind of start getting an idea of the structure of this file. So once we've gone through the ELF header, we want to enter the program header table. And that gives us a lot more information about how we actually need to start managing this file. See, the program header table is going to point to several segments. These segments give you a lot of information about the actual contents of our executable. Here's what an entry in the program header table will give us information on. The, one of the big ones is the P type. The P type will be one of several enumerated options. In this case, all that we actually care about are PT load and PT enter. There's a lot of information stored in the other ones, but like I said, we're just trying to stay in the middle of the complexity. So if we pull out our segments knowing that we only care about the PT interp and PT load, then we can start managing our segments. And actually, if you remember from what I said previously, the interpreter is going to be that file that we want to use to load in dynamic linking. Well, we already know what that was for this specific file, so I can just show you guys that right here. And then we have the PT load. The PT load is actually the information that's stored in our file that we need to map into memory. So if we've got main's virtual address space here, then we know that if this is a PT load segment, then that PT load segment needs to be loaded into memory, and that's specified by the parameters that we found in the program header table for this segment. Then all that we have to do if we want to run this program is take the entry point that we found in the ELF header, pass the execution and to jump to that location, and then continue execution from there, and that's really it. I mean, in the most simple case of when you're mapping an executable into memory, this is how you would do it. You map it into memory, pass the execution point to the entry point, and then run the program. But that leaves out a pretty important point. If we're just mapping this program into memory and trying to jump to the entry point there, well, for a statically linked binary, that'll work because all of the dependencies were actually brought into the binary at compile time when we're compiling and linking it. However, if we've got a dynamically linked binary, like most times you do in modern development, you actually don't have all of the dependencies available strictly within the file that you're trying to run. In order to actually get those dependencies available, they need to be found on the system and then linked into the code so that they're available in memory when we try to start the process execution. In order to do this, we have a separate program, which is called the interpreter that I mentioned before. However, that's a full another can of worms, and so for now, we're going to leave it here. If you guys thought this was interesting, then maybe I'll make another video in the future talking about what actually happens when we load the interpreter. Thanks for watching, guys. I hope you enjoyed, and I'll see you guys next time.